This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a podcast produced by the Dream of the Open Channel. This is your host, Paul Carr. Back in May of 2014, I interviewed Dr. Abel Mendez of the University of Puerto Rico's Planetary Habitability Lab. And obviously, we talked about exoplanets and how many were known to be habitable and why they were thought to be habitable. And, well, I'm going to let Dr. Mendez tell you all about that in just a minute. But let me just say, I, I plan to put this out in June of 2014, hoping to have a suitably, a suitable interview to match it with and have a nice long episode about exoplanets and planetary habitability and the third term in the Drake equation. Uh, we didn't get that, that second interview yet, so I'm just going to go ahead and put this out. It's about uh, 38 minutes long. Uh, Dr. Mendez is the head of the... Planetary Habitability Lab at UPR. Now, you're probably want, going to want to go to the website as you listen to this. It's phl.upr.edu. Uh, they have a lot of good data there. They have some really nice graphics. Right now, as, as of today, I'm looking at their website, and it says that there are 21 known habitable, habitable exoplanets. Um, among the NASA Kepler candidates, which are mostly unconfirmed, there are as many as 87. So there's about 108 total possible habitable exoplanets known. Now, keep in mind, Kepler just looks at a tiny patch of the sky. It's not a full sky survey. So when we say there's 100 known, that means there's an awful lot more, a lot, lot more that we don't see right now. New missions coming up like TESS or PLATO uh, will see a lot more exoplanets and will get even better statistics as time goes on. So stay tuned. Um, so anyway, here is Dr. Abel Mendez. Abel Mendez is a planetary scientist and astrobiologist at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo who studies the potential for life of planets. He's the director of the Planetary Habitability Laboratory, as we've mentioned, a virtual scientific and education lab dedicated to studies of the habitability of Earth, the solar system, and beyond. He worked at Fermilab and NASA Goddard as part of his graduate studies on theoretical physics and biophysics at the University of Puerto Rico. He also worked with Chris McKay on hab- habitability sensors at NASA Ames. Professor Mendez is best known for creating the Earth Similarity Index and maintaining the Habitable Exoplanets Catalog, which we will hear about in just a moment. His research has been highlighted by many international publications such as National Geographic, Scientific American, and Discover. Hello. Hello, Dr. Mendez. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Good. Uh, glad I finally reached you. It's my fourth or fifth attempt. But as you know, I'd like to talk to you on the Wow Signal podcast about uh, the Planetary Habitability Lab and your work on on planetary habitability. Have you sort of talked my yes, listeners through? your email. Yes, you, you, you got my email. Good. I'd like to start with, uh, first of all, uh, there will be a link in the show notes for all listeners who want to go to this uh, the website. But it's at uh, phl.upr.edu, and, uh-huh. and um, that, that's a as good a place as any to start. And on the website, you have a what they call a, a catalog of currently potentially habitable exoplanets. I think all my listeners know what an exoplanet is, but let could you could you start by defining for us what 
you mean by potentially habitable? Okay, let me. Uh, okay, so so we started the interview already, right? Say again. Yes, we started recording. We started. Yeah. Okay, start recording. Sorry. Okay. So what I mean uh, for potentially habitable planet. This is a very important concept in astrobiology because it means that a planet is suitable for life as we know it. And uh, in practice, it usually means that we know that the exoplanet has some probability of having liquid water. That's in practice. But generally speaking, it's a planet suitable for life any kind of life or microbial life or, or even to complex life. Okay. So uh, what what is it uh, just temperature that determines whether or not you can have water or is there some other factors to consider? Well, for, for, for pra in practice, when we mean liquid water, that's also constraining what are the temperatures that are... Uh, uh, needed for life. So, so it means uh, 0 to 100 degrees Celsius. So that's implied on, on, on saying that it's liquid water. So that's the general idea. But for uh, in our catalog, for the uh, for the definition that we, the actual definition that we use for considering a planet potentially habitable, there are two things. First, the planet has to be in the habitable zone. So that's uh, in the habitable zone. If the planet is in the habitable zone, it means that it has the right conditions for for liquid water. So that's one point. Now, that, but, that, that, ha that has to do with the distance from the star that the planet orbits, correct? Yes, it has to be with the, with the right distance. And the, that distance depends on the type of stars. Star that our sun has some distance that is very similar to our orbit, about one year, one AU, one astronomical unit. But stars are smaller than like K or M dwarf stars. The planet has to be closer. And period could be as short as 20 days, 30 days for the whole year on those stars. So, so the planet has to have, uh, has to be the habitable zone. And the second criteria, it has to have the right size because the right size also affects the the chance of, of it to have liquid water on the surface. If the planet is too small, then it will have not enough gravity to hold a, a, a atmosphere with liquid water. If the planet has a, a, a too big, there are two issues there. Is it too big? We, we have a very large atmosphere, very dense atmosphere, and that will cause to liquid water to be solid, no, no matter the temperature. The pressure will be so high. You put water, it uh, will become solid in the amount of temperature. But also, those large planets also means that we have more gas atmosphere. So it means that they have a larger pressure, and maybe they are ocean planets without solid surface, and that's not good either. So you, one planet that has a balance, they have a solid surface, uh, atmosphere, and liquid. So, so in a nutshell, it's a little sun and five of the planets. I see. Now your list um, in your catalog, um, if I'm counting this right. 21 planets that are currently known to be potentially habitable. Uh, yeah. And you give something called an Earth Similarity Index. How do you, how do you uh, in broad outline, how, how do you calculate that index? That's a, a complementary thing for organizing the planet. So as I, as I told you, we have these two criteria the habitable zone and the size of the planet to decide if the planet uh, six to be considered potentially habitable. Then after that, we do something else. Uh, we sort them. They said quality. So uh, what quality reference is Earth. 
So based on what we know from Earth, how these parameters, the parameters that we can measure of the planet, how they relate to Earth, if the closer that they are similar to Earth, they will be closer to a value of one. So that's by definition, Earth is one. So the farthest away from the Earth uh, parameters, it will be close to zero. So the actual parameters that we are using for this is the stellar flux size of the planet. So the stellar flux is just the insulation, how much light the planet receives, and um, uh, and the size of the planet. We use this, uh, and when I say size, it just means radius or or, or mass, because uh, for this planet we have either one or the other. And um, so we use only these two values because um, those are the only ones we have right now for for them. So the Earth similarity in this is an alternative approach. So usually it relates to uh, how we define the habitable zone because uh, planets about uh, over 0.5 in the in the Earth similarity index, they are up, they they fit also what uh, for those planets that are in the habitable zone too. So this is a very different approach. It's not considered. It's not constrained by our, our definition. The habitable zone that changed a little bit uh, in the last uh, few years. It's not constrained of that. It's a continuous scale. So, but a, a, a rule of thumb is that uh, in the Earth singularity in this any planet about 0.5 is usually one of those potentially available planets. But uh, just to say that a planet is more Earth-like based on this similarity index should go about 0.8 or 0.9. Okay, great. I'd, I'd like to circle back. I, I left out something that um, I meant to get in it that's good to you to tell us about yourself and and the history of the PHL and its mission so uh how did how did the PHL get started and how were you how did you get involved with it well i i i am a professor of physics and astrobiology at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo this university is nearby the Arecibo telescope and it's not related but um, I just have a, a good point there. I wish I could use uh, with the sort of uh, uh, radio astronomy to use the observatory because it's nearby. But uh, but I'm not working on anything related to that. So uh, my interest is in the physics and biology and the interaction of. I'm more a physicist than a biologist, but um, that's what I love to do that interaction. And in 2010, I had the idea that uh, because uh, attending this astrobiology uh, science conference, there was some big issue related to how to um, combine, how to measure habitability. There were so many questions there. So I decided at that time that the best thing to do is approach this interest. There is a new field coming in. So I decided to start that and start the, uh, the planetary habitability laboratory. So we started that uh, during the astrobiology science conference that, that day. And I just recruited uh, uh, a bunch of colleagues that uh, were working in a senior field. And um, so, hello. Uh huh. I'm sorry. I, I think I lost the last sentence there. So, uh, in 2010, we started the the planetary habitability laboratory during the uh, one of the astrobiology science conference, and um, I just uh, recruited a bunch of my colleagues that were working on the on the uh, planetary habitability, and they are helping me in this problem. So the focus of this uh, of our lab is to map the habitable universe, to up- create measures of habitability that we can apply to objects 
uh, only from solar system, but also to exoplanets. And that's what we are doing. In, in 2011, we started the catalog. That was an idea because I was uh, working with so many exoplanet data, and, and I was very interested in a way uh, what were those uh, potential available planets. And uh, it was difficult to track at that time because uh, there were many papers, and they were starting to suggest the idea uh, of, of first detection. And, and if you follow the press release, it seems that uh, available planets appear every week or so. And uh, so I decided uh, to do this as a project open also for the public because they can see what is actually available right now. Right. And, and so far you've had, as I mentioned earlier, you have about 21 listed that meet, 21. Your, meet your criteria. Um, and, mm-hmm. and you actually you have a conservative selection that I believe is 12 planets. So, um, oh yes, yes. The thing is, um, those twenty-one are we try to use open criteria just to don't miss any one of interest. So that should be very, it should be there. But uh, uh, there are still uh, people that um, that are working on more extended version of the variable zones. And they are suggesting that there are more, but yeah. that's still uh, that's still not uh, widely known. Yes. But uh, so that one, that, that sample should be everything uh, right should be there. But uh, the sample you can be more conservative in the sample, and um, and we divide the, the, those. Um, and also, it's, 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 I don't know, I don't know if there are eight, but there are four unconfirmed. So yes. uh, that has to stress that, that on none of all of the planets there are uh, confirmed. And uh, so when we buy the conservative sample, it stress out that uh, which ones are confirmed and unconfirmed. Now, can you tell us a bit about how Astronomers, it's pretty clear that how they how they they know how far away it it is from this host star by how by its period, how long it takes to come back around. But how how well do they know the mass of these stars? Is it is that a is that a, are big error bars on that, or is it pretty well understood how what the mass is? Well, unfortunately, there's a big better, a big error bars there, and then. There's other issues also that means the mass of the planet a big error because the, we know those planets by radial velocity method. So yeah. we see the star wobble, and uh, and that wobble that is it depends also in the inclination of the planetary system, and we don't know that. So when we get the mass of those planets, are the minimum mass. So it could be larger. It could be larger because the star mass, but it also depends on the star mass, and there's large error bar, 25% or even 50% or so. Plus, we have the inclination could increase dramatically the mass of the planet. If the planet, if we are seeing the planet edge on, then the, 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 the orbital edge on, then the, the mass of the planet should be very, uh, like the, the minimum mass, but otherwise it could be much larger. So there's larger error bars associated with that. Okay. Now, can we pick a couple of uh, the best planets and, and maybe tell us uh, something about what we know about each one? Uh, I think one that's been in the news a lot lately has been the, the Kepler 186F. Mm-hmm. How, mm-hmm. how do we, well, I, I, yeah. I keep reading di- that it, different things about how well we understand that planet. Uh, could you give us the, the current state of the art of our understanding? Okay, yes. Uh, uh, we have to, we can divide this population of potential available planets in two based on distance and methods. Because uh, about half of those are having the tested about radial velocity, and we only know their mass, know their size. 
And the ones detected by transit or by the Kepler mission, uh, we know their size, but not their names. So either one we know from one of those. And those Kepler planets are also very far away. Typically, they start about 500 uh, years away to 1,000 light years away. So that they are really far away. They are not in the solar neighborhood. The radio velocity planets are between uh, 10 to 50 uh, light years. So that's a, a, a big distance. So that that's that's really sad because we know a very, a very important part of this planet, their size, but they are very very far away. And in particular, Kepler 186f is he has the size closest to to uh, Earth size so far, and uh, just one point one radian. And that's, uh, that's quite good because uh, we can relate that more to the habitability of Earth. So in general size, that planet is pretty good. But the problem is in terms of distance, it's not an air light work. Because it receives a little bit less than the light that Mars receives from the, from the sun. So if you imagine that this planet has an atmosphere just like Earth, at that distance, that will be a frozen world. And that's why in our Earth Similarity Index, it's not that good as compared to others. So it has the right size, but not the right orbit. Yeah, I think it, it's, and, a, it's, uh, huh? it's the same index as Mars, actually. I think 0. 0.64. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So but it's, it's, and, it's, it's, and, bigger, it's bigger than Mars, but it's, far, it's farther away in terms of... Yes. Okay. Yes, and then and then it does that means um, uh, too cold with the atmosphere just like Earth. And but let's say it has a atmosphere that is much denser than Earth with more CO2, uh, the greenhouse uh, causing it uh, much larger greenhouse effect and um, being warmer for that. Then. The planet could have the right temperatures for for life, but there is other issue there, and this is uh, uh, considered more details of all the problem of adaptability. The thing is, is that you if you have an atmosphere of so much CO two, that definitely anyway, even that if we have the same right temperatures and liquid water will be could be running at the surface. That so much CO2 is not good for complex life. Life that needs oxygen and has to release CO2, they suffocate with that. So 4% of CO2 in the atmosphere would make life impossible for, uh, for respiration. And uh, so if that's, if that's so, and we are, and I have to start out that we are using this reference as uh, Earth life. But there are some physical and chemistry, deep physical and chemistry here that should be universal. That means that that planet, even though if it has the right temperature due to the atmosphere, it must, still will be bad probably for complex life. Good, it's still good for microbial life, but uh, not a, a good idea for complex life. So that's the that's the big issue of those planets. Now, uh, I guess your top-rated planet here so far is uh, Gliese six six seven C. Is that right? C, C a little C. Now, can you tell us a bit more about that planet? Why why it's, it's rated so high? Okay, that planet uh, and the, and the, I, I think it's not rated high in the only in the Earth in the it's, only, it's also an interest because that stars, this 667C, has uh, three potential available planets. It's the only one with three. There's a one of the Kepler uh, planets that also has uh, two in the habitable zone, but these are uh, three of those planets. So even if we miscalculate our definition of the habitable zone, we 
miscalculators, size of the stars, and then the, the size of the planet. Do we have a planet right in the spot there? So, um, uh, so the system per se is quite interesting, and uh, and the planet, one of those planets, C, uh, is at the right location for a very similar location and uh, received uh, about the same uh, light from the star than the sun, than the Earth from the sun. So that's very good. That's that's why it is high. The only problem is those planets have that are very massive, about five, four, four uh, Earth. Or five early minutes. And that that means that it could be a, a little bit larger than the Earth, 1.5 or so, um, 50% larger than the Earth. And that's not too, too bad. So that's why it doesn't uh, uh, higher. So so we see the problem here as compared to to Kepler 186F, that, that planet in particular, it has the right mass but not the right orbit. This one has the right orbit and slightly not the rough uh, size. So that's why it, it, it weighs high, much higher in the, in the Earth Similarity Index. Are you optimistic we'll find a, a planet sometime in the, in the near future that has a Earth Similarity Index very close to one? Or, uh, and if you do, is it possible that planet might be even more habitable than Earth? Okay, the, um, I I don't think it's because I uh, there's a we keep and analyze all the Kepler like data and we have some candidates there that are on average, but uh, they are still unconfirmed uh, plans from the Kepler like data, and um, so so uh, and they're about three or four or so, like that. So they are, are there in the data. So if those planets are confirmed in the near future, then we will have one much better and it will be great. The only thing is that those planets are, as, as I said, they are Kepler planets and they are very far away. Uh, we will not much more from them in the near future. Well, in, even maybe in the far future. Because they are too far, so we won't know that they have uh, the, uh, the right conditions for for classify as potential available planets. But we will not be sure if they are really available planets because we will not be able to sample the atmosphere. So what we need is one nearby planet in the 10 to uh, 100 light years away. And that's still harder because uh, we need to improve the method to detect smaller mass planets. But um, if we find a planet like that nearby, then we will be able to sample the atmosphere and detect water, detect uh, oxygen, detect CO2, all the necessary requirements for 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 life in the atmosphere and leaf. Right. Now, um, so the, uh, now I know the, uh, ESA is planning a, a mission called Plato that will look at closer stars, uh, uh-huh. in a similar way that Kepler the Kepler studies them. Yeah. There's PEX too. There, uh, PEX, uh, we go about in 2018, 2020 or so. And, and he will have the ability to detect nearby planets. Plato will be, uh, I think later, will be able to detect also uh, planets uh, nearby. So so we have the missions waiting for, and uh, but those two missions, Tess and Plato, will be delivering a lot of planets. Those, those missions are like Kepler, that will be delivering a lot of planets, a lot of an interest, and those nearby that we'll be, we'll be able to follow with ground telescope, but especially with a space telescope like the James Webb telescope. Right. Uh, now, the um, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, what your estimate is of, of what, I mean, right now we just have a handful of potentially habitable planets in your catalog. 
Uh, but we've really only um, scratched the surface of what's out there. Uh, uh-huh. I, I spoke to Jeff Marcy late last year, and his group has published a, a paper where they estimated the total percentage of of um, of habitable planets around sun-like stars being roughly 20%. Um, where, where do you think that number is likely to, to fall? The, the, throughout the galaxy, how many, how many of the stars that are like the sun do you think will have a habitable planet? Okay. Um, actually, we have some page for that. That, uh, we are putting the input from the uh, estimates of occurrence of potential habitable planets, and uh, we are c- calculating what will be the uh, the total sample nearby and um, and uh, uh, to the galaxy and even the the universe. If the if the page is called, the, uh, you can uh, search for this. It's a habitable universe. Habitable yes, universe? Uh, habitable okay. universe. Okay. Habitable universe. And um, so uh, for our neighborhood, and what I mean neighborhood is about from Earth to 10 parsecs. That's about 33 uh, light years away from it. That's our solar neighborhood. We have uh, almost about 400 stars. And the number is about from total of 400. Uh, we estimate that based on this occurrence rate, and we have to divide this occurrence rate depending for for small stars and dwarfs that are uh, that are many. I would say 75 percent of the stars are in dwarf, and for the solar type stars, so those are the G and the K stars. So. We estimate that there should be about 160 nearby within 33 like, years from here. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. Uh, so we need to find one that is transiting. But for the whole, whole galaxy, remember the numbers is about uh, 40 to 50, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, 40 to 50 billion uh, potential available planets in the whole galaxy. Yes, I, remember, I think that's the correct number. And um, uh, I mean, the, in the whole universe, that that is trillion. So the, those are the odds are very good that, that, that we are surrounded by this planet that uh, we still don't have the capability to detect mass of them. Because they are small, and, uh, and or because of the transit method, they have to be transit, and there's a low probability for detection of those kind of transit. Right. So, so we are surrounded by this. So, so a lot of, of opportunity. We are just the beginning. When we started the catalog in 2011, we had just only two at that time. So I was uh, concerned that way. I was starting a catalog for this project, and there's two, and I wasn't expecting to have maybe in years uh, more than that. But then I was surprised. Next year, the second year, now we are we are to 21, and that was much more than I said. So now for for we include the Kepler candidates. But still, we need to confirm. But remember, those are far away. Uh, we will have, if they are confirmed, like, they have more than uh, uh, 80, about 100. Right. Just if, if they are confirmed by next year. So there's a, a lot of, uh, of objects of interest. Okay. Um- I'm sure you get asked a lot of questions about your work. Uh, what's the question you don't get asked that you wish people would ask you? Uh, when when people ask you questions about your work, uh, especially for the general public, 
what question do you think they fail to ask? Is there is there one that we're missing? Well, things that uh, that I have to clarify, and people make some assumptions. It's important assumptions is um, uh, when they see a lot in the news that uh, a new Earth-like planet or a uh, habitable planet is detected. Um, you generally think that uh, that is more Earth-like than a storm it is. Uh -huh. So I have to stress out that uh, when uh, whenever you see those claims, it's just the size and the orbit of the planet, the right orbit of the planet. Yeah, we really so, don't know much more than that, typically, right? Yes, yes, we wish to. We wish to know more than that. We just don't so, have the telescopes that, yet, right? Yes. Yeah. And I uh, uh, have to clarify that, that uh, only what well, we know, but we wish to know more. Yes. But that is, this, this is a great time. This is the beginning. Right. So uh, soon we should, over the next generation or so, we should have a much better feel for, for at least the nearby planets, in terms of, and perhaps more information just their size and mass. Like uh, oh, mm -hmm. now, yeah, the, the sort of things we'd like to measure, were, yeah, like uh, say the atmospheric content. Mm -hmm. uh, what what kind of instruments do we need to do that? Okay, those instruments and the general uh, uh, the science and technology to do so, we already have that. It's just the problem of uh, funding for, for for developing the the these instruments and launching these instruments. First, instrument has to be in a space, so they are they're more expensive. And uh, with the James Webb telescope, we will be scratching the the uh, our ability to sample the atmosphere of the Earth's planet. And I say scratching because this is the limit edge. It's right for larger planets. We could sample very easily the atmosphere of larger planets but for those air size. It is just uh, in the limit of detection. But we will create, and there are many ideas, like using the star shape to block the light of the spiritual light of the planet. And if we ever uh, build such uh, combination of instruments, we will be able to sample the individual life of Earth-sized planet and measure very easily their um, atmospheric compositions for the, for searching for biosignatures, gases like oxygen and CO2 and having water. So that means all the panorama. And the planets we we go from potentially habitable to truly habitable uh, planets. Uh, but it does that doesn't mean that they have life. It doesn't mean they have the right condition for life as we know it. And eventually maybe in twenty or thirty years we have the capability of as this as now that we see the light of the planet as the planet rotates, we will see changes in the light of that planet caused by cloud cover, oceans and land areas. And we will be able not only to say something about the atmosphere but also about the surface, like uh, how much uh, ocean area it has respect to the land area. And as instruments improve and we get better at spectroscope, then we will be able to sample the red edge. The red edge is, is a big, we can, means that we will be able to be, differentiate the absorption of light by plants. And if the planet has a, a wide coverage of vegetation, be able to detect the, that uh, vegetation. That's that's a hard problem. The theory that is possible, 
but uh, we need the technology in the space to do so. So maybe 20, 30, 40 years we have the capability, but it still means that in our, uh, our time, we have the potential to detect life on this planet, not only to say that the planet are variable, but also that the planet has life, at least uh, plant life. And then everything stops. Because the other interesting question will be, okay, if a planet has uh, plant life, does it have animal life? Does it have intelligent life? That's definitely outside in the, uh, of our technology right now. So right. for that, we have to wait much longer. Right. So, well, I think any kids listening now, you have your, you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> uh, you can go study under Dr. Mendez and learn how to detect these things. Okay, well, uh, anything else that you'd like to mention about Planetary Helpability Lab or any future projects you have that my listeners might be interested in? Well, yes, okay. We have right now some uh, 21 candidates. I can tell you that 22 is coming soon. Mm -hmm. uh, we are ready now for, for final confirmation. Good. And um, we try to put their, those plans at the same time that they are published in the press and uh, evaluated. We will expand our site, uh, our site, we know more details about this planet. We have uh, an orbit, uh, orbit catalog. If you search also at the PSL for the, the planet orbit catalog, we have a lot of details about the orbit, the temperatures, and the size of this planet. It's okay. quite, it's quite detailed there. And, um, we have a lot of projects uh, uh, related more also with the uh, biology. What are the limits of life? One of the projects we're working is the limits of life. So it's putting together in one place what we know about what are the actual limits of life with regard to different uh, uh, environmental parameters. So putting more biology here for the uh, for planet for the astron uh, astronomy community. Okay. Well, uh, that's uh, phl.upr.edu. It's uh, under the University of Puerto Rico. Uh, Abel Mendez, thanks so much for your time. Uh, and it's a pleasure. I appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for this relatively short episode of The Wow Signal. I hope you enjoyed listening to Dr. Mendez and his insights into what makes a planet habitable and how we know that it's habitable. Uh, there'll be a lot more work on this in the future, so um, I'm sure we'll be getting back to him in a year or two for an update. Now, we'd like to hear feedback from you about this episode and any others. If you have questions for me or for Dr. Mendez, uh, please either go to wowsignalpodcast.com and leave a comment there on the blog for this episode, or you can go either to our subreddit, the Wow Signal Podcast subreddit on Reddit, or you can go to our Google Plus community. Um, just go to Google Plus and, and it's a free, com anybody's free to join that community. Um, for the Wow Signal podcast listeners. Love to hear from you. We also like your suggestions for future guests and future topics. You can also email wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and we'll be happy to respond to that. Um, also, if you could, please leave us a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast aggregation service, whatever it may be. That would be really helpful, helps get the word out, helps us find our new audience. We know that the roughly 200 subscribers we have now and average number of about 800 to 1,000 downloads for each episode, we feel that the, that the audience is actually much, much larger than that. I'd like to hear from you. You can follow us on Twitter at podcastwow. And... 
please retweet when you see our tweets about the episodes promoting the podcast and the episode. You can support us financially at patreon.com slash wowsignal. Just go there. Uh, very small amounts of money per episode will help a lot. One dollar an episode will be tremendous. We will personally thank you on air. Also, you can buy a t-shirt or a coffee cup or something with the Wow Signal logo on it at Cafe Press. So uh, let's get the community moving. Let's get the community active. Not just me talking to you, but you talking to each other and to everyone. Let's let's have a, an ongoing conversation about all the topics we cover on the Wow Signal. Now, coming up soon, we hope to have a really good episode on the asteroid threat to Earth. And that will include two guests, Duncan Lunan and someone from the Harvard uh, Minor Planet Center. We'll have that name for you shortly. Now, uh, also, I'm thinking we will do our real wow signal coverage episode, guest or no guest. However, right now I have a good lead on a potentially excellent guest, somebody who was heavily involved with the Big Ear SETI effort. So uh, that's coming up also soon, probably before the end of the year. And um, there will be more on SETI. I hope to co cover optical SETI in particular sometime in January. As for our hiatus, well, we pr pretty much had that in October. But uh, we may have a short hiatus right around the latter part of December, early January. I also expect you'll hear more from the other team members in the coming months. So, once again, let us hear from you at wowsignalpodcast.com. And now, it's been a while since I've played anything by the talented North Carolina guitar-drum duo a Luchatista, so I'm going to play this tune, which you can actually download for yourself on the internet. It's called, it's called Mistaken Identity. the wow signal a podcast produced by the dream of the open channel please visit wowsignalpodcast.com for more information all music presented on this podcast is either creative commons or is presented with the permission of the artist the wow signal is distributed under the creative commons attribution share alike license